Devil Exposed, a twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels, by Matthew B. Cox, narrated by Sean Milo. All four tires of the Porsche caught air as the vehicle shot out of the building's underground garage. The fire alarm screamed in the distance. The ice lamp, located on the top floor of the Sunset Plaza condominium building, was burning. The European supercar hit the asphalt with a thud. Pierre Rossini yanked the steering wheel to the left and fishtailed onto Sunset Boulevard. The Louis Vuitton duffel bag, containing over half a million dollars in cash, slipped off of the passenger seat and onto the floorboard. Rossini whipped by the fire department's trucks, and the Porsche roared down the boulevard. Once inside, the firemen not only discovered a lab, product, and money. They also recovered John Ellenberger's California driver's license, Joey Escobaza's personal effects, and Rossini's laptop. In short order, the LAPD discovered that Joey's name was on the lease, and that the utilities were in the name of Jason Parham. That night, the discovery of the lab was on the local news. The following day, Rossini, Ellenberger, Joey, and Jesse Velasquez, the Sinola cartel's operative who supplied the raw methamphetamine used to produce the ice, met at the food court in Newport Beach. Everyone was freaking out, and no one knew what to do. Rossini had already begun making arrangements with an attorney to turn himself in when Ellenberger instructed him to call Mark Farchione, specifically to see if the crooked FBI agent had heard anything about the lab. What the fuck are you guys doing? Farchione blurted out of the payphone's receiver. Are you fucking crazy? Farchione and his partner, Sean Barrero, an agent with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, were dirty agents. Farchione growled, You're in a lot of trouble. Sensing an opportunity, Rossini said, However much trouble I may be in, pales in comparison to how much trouble you and Sean are in. He told Farchione that if he, Ellenberger, Joey, Arya Nakiavani, or Jason were charged, arrested, or even questioned about the lab, I'll drop a dime on you and Sean so fucking fast your heads will spin. If I'm going to prison, I'm taking you thieving bastards with me. After a long silence, Farchione said, We'll take care of it. One week later, he told Rossini, It's all clear. We tanked the investigation. According to Farchione, Barrero had ordered the LAPD to stand down. My name is Matthew Cox, and I'm a true crime writer. You should know, however, I am also a prisoner, incarcerated at the Coleman Federal Correctional Complex in Central Florida, the largest complex in the nation. That's how I became acquainted with Pierre Rossini in October of 2017. Rossini is thin, with a shaved head, and all the trappings of a computer geek. Wire-rimmed glasses, a quiet demeanor, an articulate speech. Nothing about him indicates he was once a Los Angeles drug kingpin, currently serving a sentence for the murder of two federal informants. He tells me he didn't commit the crime that he spent the last 17 years incarcerated for. Rossini tells me he has an overwhelming amount of court records, including all of the sealed documents, the contradicting statements by prosecutors, the lies. The government, says Rossini, put me in prison for 40 years for ordering the murder of a confidential informant that they later discovered someone else had ordered, and for putting a bullet in a second informant's head that someone else has admitted to strangling. Rossini's parents were married in the mid-60s. His father was a Brazilian immigrant of Italian descent, his mother a Latina bookworm. Rossini was born in 69. He was raised in a home with lots of love and support, although they were not well off financially. My father lost his job in 1980, says Rossini. As a 12-year-old, I didn't have an appreciation of how bad things had become until my parents told me we were moving to Los Angeles. The Rossinis moved into a small apartment in the city of West Covina, a suburban Los Angeles community, so that he and his brother could attend good public schools. He found himself in a constant effort to be accepted, to blend in. He wasn't a big kid, and he wasn't good at sports. He was a computer geek who took advanced classes and played the piano. He spent most of his time hanging out in the library, programming video games on his home computer, or skateboarding. It wasn't until he entered Covina High School that Rossini built strong friendships. Over the next few years, he became friends with Sean Fisher, 
Robert Sweeney, Kyle Martinez, and Johnny Escoboza, among others. At the time, ecstasy hadn't been criminalized and teens couldn't get enough of it. As far as I was concerned, recalls Rossini, ecstasy was the greatest thing ever. The first substantial interaction Rossini had with John Ellenberger was in January 1989 at a New Year's party in Tijuana, Mexico. Ellenberger lived in Newport Beach, Orange County, and had grown up a rich kid. He'd fly to Europe with his Beverly Hills Circle to attend ecstasy-fueled parties. The 24-year-old loved the rave culture of music, sex, and above all, ecstasy. John was an elitist, says Rossini. He didn't care if you liked him, but he did want you to envy him. Exceptionally good-looking, Ellenberger showed up at the after-party, sporting an over-the-top Playboy model, with his expensive Mercedes parked outside. The following week, Rossini was with John Escoboza in West Covina when Ellenberger arrived in his Ferrari to pick up Johnny's older brother, Joey. Rossini turned to Johnny and asked, Have you ever met anyone like this guy? Rossini quickly learned that Ellenberger's income was derived from cocaine trafficking and that Joey was involved. By that spring, Ellenberger and Joey had also begun dealing ecstasy, which had recently been criminalized. During the 4th of July holiday, at a nightclub, Ellenberger pulled Rossini aside and confided, I'm trying to put together a sales force to hit clubs. He was currently purchasing ecstasy pills in bulk at $9 per dose, then reselling them for 11 per dose to other wholesalers. Ecstasy, however, was retailing for $20 to $25 per dose, Ellenberger wanted to capture that spread. Why me? asked Rossini. Plenty of his peers would have jumped at the opportunity. Because Joey says you're the guy that can organize these idiots. Ellenberger leaned into Rossini and said, You can pull it off. Why not? thought Rossini. It's a harmless party drug. Spice was a Hollywood nightclub where the A-list entertainment industry crowd partied. The kind of place where, on any given night, you could find John Bon Jovi jamming with Billy Idol in the VIP room with Brian Setzer. 1,020-somethings mixed with movie stars, rock stars, and supermodels. On the night of October 4, 1989, Rossini approached nearly every pretty girl at Spice, offering to sell them ecstasy. Four hours later, he'd sold over $6,500 worth, 300 doses, and made himself $1,500. He then began recruiting friends, Johnny Escoboza, Robert Sweeney, and Sean Fisher. Together, with half a dozen friends, the boys from West Covina began selling hundreds of doses of ecstasy per night. By November, however, Rossini had exhausted Ellenberger's supply. Within a couple of weeks, Ellenberger met with his supplier, Ariane Nakjivani, an Iranian-American living in the Hollywood Hills, whom he was friends with. Ellenberger obtained additional product, Rossini and his friends began bombarding clubs from Beverly Hills to Newport Beach, distributing thousands of ecstasy tablets. Then, suddenly, Ellenberger's coffer ran dry again. The supply was becoming an issue, Rossini tells me. By spring break 1990, it was clear Ellenberger had to come up with an alternative source. He knew a guy who knew a chemist, Dr. Lester Friedman, a retired University of Southern California chemistry professor, Friedman was willing to develop a formula for the production of pharmaceutical-grade MDMA, ecstasy. That changed everything. Where the fuck is this guy? Ellenberger barked at Rossini. It was early November 1990, and no one had heard from the chemist in days. You were supposed to be watching him. How am I supposed to know he was going to take off? Rossini snapped back. Ellenberger, Rossini, Aria, Joey, Sean, and Robert were standing inside an industrial warehouse next to a stainless steel rectangular workstation, one of half a dozen outfitted with chemistry racks, stacked with an array of laboratory glassware and reaction vessels. There were rows of 55-gallon drums of chemicals, necessary for the manufacturing of MDMA, and decoy-based fertilizer material to keep up appearances. The precursor chemicals required to manufacture the MDMA compound are highly regulated, and despite Dr. Friedman's credentials, he couldn't simply order the material. Instead, Ellenberg's manufacturing team, Friedman, Fincher, and Rossini, developed formulas for the production of each of the precursors from non-regulated compounds. 
During that period of time, they had gone from a small lab in a Long Beach business park to a 6,000-square-foot facility in the agricultural community of the Inland Empire under the guise of Didorex Inc., Latin for Money Kings, a boutique research and development company that specialized in producing custom fertilizers and pesticides. Finally, after several months of trial and error, they had developed the ability to produce pharmaceutical-grade MDMA. The team was on their way to achieving their goal of manufacturing tens of thousands of doses per month. Millions of dollars' worth of ecstasy was within their grasp. Unfortunately, during the arduous journey, the team discovered that Dr. Friedman, a tall, thin, bald man in his early 60s, was addicted to free-based cocaine. Due to the numerous delays in reverse engineering the manufacturing process, coupled with Friedman's disappearing acts, Ellenberger had grown to despise the chemist. Hours later, Friedman paged Rossini. However, when Rossini called the number, the individual that answered him told him, I got your man here. Friedman and his girlfriend had smoked nearly $12,000 worth of some dealer's cocaine. You want to see him again? You got to get me that bread. Ellenberger and Sean dropped off the money and picked up the chemist. The subsequent meeting instantly erupted into a shouting match between Ellenberger and Friedman, with Rossini caught in the middle. You old fucking crackhead, spat Ellenberger. You work for me. It's not crack, it's freebase, you ignorant fool, Friedman screamed back. He turned to Rossini and said, I refuse to work under these conditions. And the chemist stormed off, mumbling something about being personal friends with Timothy Leary, one of the founders of the LSD movement in the 60s. Rossini had watched the same scene play out over and over again. The next morning, the chemist was back at the lab with Rossini and the team. Within months, says Rossini, the lab was turning out product and everyone was making money. Ellenberger moved into a spacious house in Beverly Hills. Rossini was driving a new 5 Series BMW, living in Beverly Hills, and dating a beautiful new girlfriend. And because of their pharmaceutical-grade ecstasy, they had become known throughout the higher-level trafficking community. Sean Barrero was a special agent with the California Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement, BNE. He was cross-designated by the FBI as a special federal officer and assigned to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, OCDETF, in Northern California. The investigations conducted by federal OCDETF units target major drug trafficking organizations. Barrero specialized in operating in an undercover capacity, posing as a large-scale cocaine trafficker out of San Francisco. His primary asset was Mark Farchione, a professional BNE informant, a lean, long-haired Harley Davidson aficionado, who partied with porn stars and maintained ties with the Bay Area's chapters of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. Despite their agent and asset roles, Barrero and Farchione's main focus was on ripping off drug dealers. In fact, Farchione was so immersed in the endeavor, he was known to impersonate an agent, complete with an FBI badge and weapon. For all intents and purposes, Farchione and Barrero were partners. Ellenberger developed an affinity for Barrero's informant that summer because of their mutual passion for Harley-Davidson motorcycles. Around this same time period, Ellenberger was approached by a member of Hell's Angels. The Outlaw Motorcycle Club wanted to have ephedrine manufactured into methamphetamine in exchange for supplying one of the compounds required to manufacture ecstasy. Rossini and Friedman spent a couple of days in the UCLA Chemistry Library researching the manufacturing process. The Hell's Angels provided Ellenberger with 55 pounds of ephedrine. Under the tutelage of the chemist, Ellenberger's manufacturing team was able to achieve a 90-plus percent yield, producing pharmaceutical-grade methamphetamine. It was so pure, it was blinding white, says Rossini. The Hell's Angels were used to the more common peanut butter hue associated with the lower-quality product saturated with impurities. They accused us of cutting it with inositol. Following the second extraction, Rossini and Friedman added brown food coloring to meet their expectations. It was still 99% pure, but kind of tannish brown, Rossini laughs. The problem was that Ellenberger now wanted to start manufacturing meth in addition to making ecstasy and distributing cocaine. The two Ferraris blew by Rossini so quickly, the rush of air rocked his new BMW. Less than a second later, Jay Gardena's Porsche 930 shot by him. The three supercars swerved to the left as they raced down Sunset Boulevard, through the heart of Beverly Hills. 
Between September and December, the lab produced over 30 kilos of ecstasy with a wholesale value of nearly $3 million. The money had amplified everything. The parties, the vehicles, the women, and things were getting out of control. It was December 7th, 1991, the night after Ellenberger's 27th birthday. Ellenberger, Aria, Farchione, and Joey had been out clubbing at Bar One in Beverly Hills with a half dozen of the West Covina guys when Rossini called it a night. Shortly after he'd left the club in his newest BMW, a conspicuous black 7 series, Ellenberger challenged Farchione and Jay to race down the strip. Ellenberger's black Ferrari was in the lead as the tightly packed vehicles made a slight right and a sharp left as sunset snaked through the luxury homes and palm trees. The informant was becoming a fixture among Ellenberger's circle. Still, Rossini didn't trust him. He wasn't from West Covina, and they didn't know a thing about him. Farchione's presence was unnerving. Just before Christmas, Ellenberger and the chemist got into another argument. This time it was over money. As a result, while Ellenberger, Aria, Farchione, and Joey were celebrating the New Year's in Beverly Hills, Friedman cleaned out the entire lab, including all of the customized equipment and 15 kilos of ecstasy, 120,000 doses. With the chemist holding the lab equipment and remaining product hostage, Rossini began obtaining ecstasy from Aria Nakjavani through Ellenberger. He distributed the product to his network of wholesale customers in Phoenix, Chicago, Seattle, and Miami. Ellenberger was under investigation by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. However, they hadn't arrested him. Compounding Ellenberger's problems, a federal OCDETF investigation into Ellenberger's cocaine activity had been launched. Meanwhile, the DEA was investigating Ellenberger's methamphetamine trafficking in connection with the Hells Angels. Ellenberger was under so much surveillance by so many different agencies. The street in front of his house looked like a parking lot, laughs Rossini, and he was still dealing. Regardless of their multiple federal investigations in Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Chicago, Rossini and Ellenberger continued to go out clubbing in Beverly Hills, attended the Midsummer Night's Dream Party at the Playboy Mansion, partied backstage at the MTV Music Awards, and caught every major concert in Los Angeles. Rossini was driving a Porsche 911 Turbo and dating a hot stripper. At a barbecue that summer, with Ellenberger, Aria, Farchione, Joey, and a couple dozen other guests, Rossini was introduced to Tim Robles. Robles was a very serious cocaine trafficker, says Rossini, He'd recently been released from federal prison and was looking to re-enter the business in a big way. Rossini was sitting at a Formica table at a Burger King in Hollywood on November 8, 1992. Ellenberger was pitching the idea of supplying Robles with cocaine when Robles placed a Tic Tac container on the surface of the table and slid it to Ellenberger. Can you make this? asked Robles. Ellenberger could see a single crystal shard through the clear plastic casing. What is it? It's a crystal, he replied. They call it ice, and it's a fucking gold mine. Ellenberger handed the clear plastic container to Rossini, who held it up to the light. He examined the crystal and said, Yeah, we can make this, provided you supply the raw material or the chemicals to manufacture it. Within weeks of that meeting, Rossini, Robert, and Sean got a condo in the same luxury high-rise building located at the base of the Hollywood Hills where Ellenberger and Aria were now living. With their training under Dr. Friedman, they were able to convert pounds of methamphetamine into ice and achieve 100% purity levels. By June, Ellenberger, Joey, Sean, Robert, and Kyle Martinez, another one of Rossini's best friends from high school, were rocking and rolling, says Rossini. Ellenberger was trafficking cocaine and converting methamphetamine into ice. Aria and Robles were distributing the product. The money was obscene. Ellenberger was making half a million a month. He began making weekly trips to Las Vegas. His gambling was out of control and, despite being engaged to Jenny Braybrooks, Ellenberger was juggling other women on the side. Joey Escoboza leased a penthouse in an iconic multi-story condominium tower on Sunset Plaza Drive. Rock stars and other celebrities lived in the building, including a couple of the cast from the series Beverly Hills 90210. Ellenberger assembled a new conversion lab and began producing the next load, more than 100 pounds of ice, 
worth over $3 million. While Ellenberger was producing the ice, Robles needed to obtain an additional 50 kilos of cocaine. Ellenberger reached out to Farchione, whom, much to his surprise, agreed to supply Robles with the product on a consignment basis. After operating in an undercover capacity for 22 months, Barrero and Farchione's moment had finally arrived. They tossed the cash into a silver Halliburton suitcase, $300,000 of well-circulated bills. It was October 19, 1993. Ellenberger and Joey were meeting with Farchione and Barrero at the Sunset Plaza penthouse. The sole purpose of the meeting was to allow Farchione and Barrero to inspect Robles' money, which was being used to pay for 20 of the kilos of cocaine. Cash on delivery for 20 kilos, with the remaining 30 being supplied on consignment. The transaction was scheduled to take place the following morning in the building's subterranean parking garage. Visible in the living room was over $3 million worth of ice, drying in plain sight of two guys that Rossini had already voiced his distrust of. They weren't from West Covina. As Joey turned to place the suitcase in one of the adjacent rooms, Ellenberger said, You know what? Just give it to him. Joey's gaze ricocheted between Ellenberger and Rossini. Joey replied, Tim said not to give him the money until we got his product. That's my bro, dude, Ellenberger said, motioning toward Farchione. He's good. Rossini remained silent. The transaction was strictly between Ellenberger, Farchione, Barrero, and Robles. As such, Ellenberger let Farchione and Barrero walk out of the penthouse with Robles' cash. An amazingly reckless decision. The next morning, Ellenberger rode the elevator down to the garage around 11 a.m., to let Farchione, Barrero, and Kurt Scott, another of Barrero's professional informants, in to deliver the 50 kilos. He got into Farchione's white BMW 5 Series, and without explanation, the informant, playing FBI agent, handed Ellenberger several manila file folders. Ellenberger flipped them open and found Department of Justice reports, as well as surveillance and booking photos of Ellenberger, Robles, and Arya. Farchione pulled out his FBI badge, connected to a lanyard around his neck, and said, I love you like a brother, bro, but my partner and I have been working this case for two years. He informed Ellenberger that the building was surrounded. He could see Scott sitting in a Ford Dually 20 yards away. If you don't come off the product, we're going to take you down. Ellenberger then called Joey and Rossini and instructed them to pack up all the remaining ice and bring it downstairs. There's a Chrysler LeBaron convertible parked behind the Café Med. What are you talking about? Don't ask any questions, said Ellenberger, and he repeated the instructions. They did precisely as they were told. In plain sight of Farchione, Barrero, and Scott, Rossini tossed the ice in the back of the convertible. Farchione showed him the DOJ files, the booking photos, the reports. You come off the product or everyone goes down, said Farchione. That's the deal. Farcion was upset to learn they had just missed a 50-pound shipment that Joey and Rossini had delivered to Robles' people earlier that morning. Nevertheless, there were still 42 pounds of ice remaining for Farcion and Barrero to extort. Rossini and Ellenberger stood on the sidewalk as Farcion, Barrero, and Scott drove off with the remaining 42 pounds of ice, in addition to ripping off $300,000 of Robles' cash, a total loss of over $1.5 million dollars. Keep in mind, it was known within the traffic community that Robles was good for several murders. You may very well catch a slug for this, Rossini told Ellenberger. Robles was the largest trafficker of ice on the West Coast by this point, in addition to being a major cocaine trafficker. He was also on federal parole. The FBI, DEA, and BNE all had active investigations targeting him. You've got me meeting with fucking FBI agents? yelled Robles at a meeting several hours later. It could have been worse. Shut up! You shut your fucking mouth! spat Robles. Ellenberger didn't know anything about Farchione or Barrero. Not their last names, addresses, or where any of their associates lived. Nothing. You vouched for these guys! For Ellenberger, this was the beginning of the end. Word spread fast that he had vouched for an FBI agent, that he had been played for a sucker. Everyone within the higher-level trafficking community began to question Ellenberger's judgment, and some, including a drug trafficker named Lance Estes, 
had become suspicious that he may have been secretly working as an informant. Rather than maintain a low profile, to allow the situation with Robles to blow over, however, Ellenberger began dealing with a couple of Robles' men behind Robles' back in response to his vitriolic attacks. On December 7, 1993, Rossini was alone in the lab, burning off solvents in order to extract the remaining product suspended within the chemical solution. Unwittingly, he placed one of the vessels directly underneath a sprinkler head. A lick of flame escaped into the air and triggered the fire alarm. Suddenly, the building system erupted into a massive series of alarms. In panic, as the fire department screamed toward the building, Rossini grabbed over $650,000 and raced to the building's elevators. While the firefighters kicked in the penthouse's door, all four tires of Rossini's Porsche caught air as the vehicle shot out of the building's underground garage. Once inside, the fire department not only discovered a lab, product, and money, they also recovered Ellenberger's California driver's license, Joey Escobosa's personal effects, and Rossini's laptop. In short order, LAPD discovered that Joey's name was on the lease, and that the utilities were in Jason Parham's name. That night, the discovery of the ice lab was on the local news. The following day, Rossini, Ellenberger, Joey, and Jesse Velasquez, the Sinaloa cartel's operative, who supplied the raw methamphetamine used to produce the ice, met at the food court at the Fashion Island Mall in Newport Beach. The scene was complete chaos. Everyone was freaking out. Ellenberger was still out on bond for the Flanagan burglary. None of them knew what to do. Rossini had already begun making arrangements with an attorney to turn himself in, when Ellenberger decided they should call Farchione to see if he'd heard anything about the lab. Since Rossini was to blame for the predicament, he was told to make the call. What the fuck are you guys doing? Farchione blurted out in a panic. Why'd you guys go back to that building? Are you fucking crazy? Seven weeks earlier, on the day of the purported reverse sting, Barrero had deceived his superiors into believing that the Sunset Plaza residence had been vacated, that the lab had been moved, and that they had just missed intercepting a multi-million dollar shipment. The whole operation ended with no arrests being made. Now, suddenly, a lab was found. Barrero had spent the day being grilled by his superiors. We gave you a pass, growled Farchione. You're in a lot of trouble. Rossini could hear the panic in Farchione's voice. Sensing an opportunity, he said, However much trouble I may be in pales in comparison to how much trouble you and Sean are in. He told Farchione that if he, Ellenberger, Joey, Aria, or Jason were charged, arrested, or even questioned about the lab, I'll drop a dime on you and Sean so fucking fast your heads will spin. If I'm going to prison, I'm taking you thieving bastards with me. After a long silence, Farchione said, We'll take care of it. One week later, he told Rossini, It's all clear. We tanked the investigation. According to Farchione, Barrero had ordered LAPD to stand down. Put that motherfucker on the phone, growled Robles out of the receiver. Rossini and Ellenberger were standing at a payphone in Miami, and Robles had just found out that Gary Bernard, one of Robles' customers, had been arrested. And as it turned out, Bernard had been supplying ice to one of Robles' distributors in Honolulu behind Robles' back. Unfortunately, Bernard had been arrested after his courier had gotten cold feet and turned in nearly one million dollars worth of ice, and the DEA had entered the picture. Worse still, Ellenberger had been dealing with Bernard behind Robles' back. As a result, much of the ice seized had belonged to Robles. It boils down to this. Ellenberger had just lost another million dollars of Robles' product. Just a few days after they had dodged a bullet with the Sunset Plaza matter, Robles now had to contend with yet another investigation. I'm going to kill him. All right, now, Tim, this isn't entirely his fault, lied Rossini. It was 100% Ellenberger's fault. He's in a lot of trouble, too. The Barnard matter was out of Honolulu, making it the fourth federal investigation Ellenberger was embroiled in that year. Put that motherfucker on the phone. Rossini handed the receiver to Ellenberger, and he placed it to his ear. Instantly, Ellenberger winced. Then he slowly placed the receiver in the payphone's cradle and sighed, He said he's going to kill me. Rossini and Ellenberger spent New Year's in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 
trying to come up with a plan to deal with the Robles issue. A month later, things really took a nosedive for Ellenberger. Arya Nakhchivani, in an act of Shakespearean treachery, told Ellenberger's fiancée, Jenny Braybrooks, about Ellenberger's infidelity with numerous women, one of whom he had impregnated. Jenny immediately ended their four-year relationship. With Ellenberger out of the country, Arya was free to seduce his girl. While Ellenberger suspected several individuals of betraying him, he never once suspected Arya. After Farchion sent word that the Barnard investigation had stalled, Ellenberger immediately returned to Beverly Hills. He stepped out of the breezeway into the terminal at LAX in early March 1994. Despite Robles' threat, he was desperate to salvage his relationship with Jenny. Over the next few months, Ellenberger tried everything he could think of to repair the relationship, but nothing worked. Keep in mind, unbeknownst to Ellenberger, Aria was now sleeping with Jenny. Ellenberger had caused so many problems within the higher-level trafficking community, no one wanted to deal with him. And, as a result of Barnard's arrest, Lance Estes, a fellow drug trafficker, was openly calling Ellenberger an FBI informant. Ellenberger went from dealing with A-level cartel traffickers to obtaining product from second-rate dealers such as John Alonso and Ken Bugren. Over the next seven months, Ellenberger's circumstances continued to deteriorate to the point where he had to sell off his vehicles to pay his gambling debts. Ellenberger turned to Joey Escobosa, who had underworld contacts, and by November, he was back in business converting meth into ice. By this point, Gary Barnard, who had not yet been charged for the million dollars worth of product seized in Orange County ten months earlier, had been released from federal prison after serving a parole violation. Barnard had yet to be screwed over by Ellenberger and was therefore willing to resume their trafficking relationship. What neither of them knew, however, was that the FBI had taken over the investigation into the Barnard-related seizure and had folded that matter into the FBI DEA Strike Force's investigation targeting Tim Robles' operation. By Thanksgiving, Ellenberger was supplying pounds of ice to Aria and Barnard. Aria's cousin Reza was friends with a male model named Frank Nason. 21 years old, extremely handsome, and charismatic, Nason moved to L.A. to pursue a modeling and acting career. In October 1994, Ellenberger hired him as a glorified errand boy. Nason idolized Ellenberger, Rossini confides, and in return, Ellenberger took every opportunity to belittle and embarrass him. It was one slight after another. The grand opening of the Hard Rock Cafe and Casino was on March 9, 1995. The resort was teeming with celebrities, as well as Vegas royalty, mobsters and drug traffickers. Ellenberger and one of his mob buddies were walking out of the restroom when Ellenberger locked eyes with FBI agent Mark Farchione. The informant and his partner, Sean Barrero, were at the Hard Rock partying with a couple of porn stars. The men shared an awkward exchange, and after a couple of drinks, Farchione confided in Ellenberger that they were in Sin City, operating in an undercover capacity, targeting a San Francisco ice trafficker that had moved his operation from the Bay Area to Vegas. Farchione told Ellenberger they needed to come up with some ice to establish their bona fides. Can you get us some? asked Farchione. Four to eight ounces is all we need. Given the multiple investigations into Ellenberger's drug activity, he surmised that having two crooked agents in his pocket might come in handy. Sure, he replied. I'll hook you up. How much ice did Ellenberger supply? I asked Rossini. He tells me that over the ensuing six weeks, Ellenberger supplied Farchione with a couple of pounds. The ice isn't important, he says. What's important is Farchione and Barrero being willing to be bought. Specifically, the informant and his FBI handler were willing to compromise investigations and identify confidential informants within Ellenberger's trafficking circle. It's not that uncommon. By that spring, Rossini and Bugrin had allowed Ellenberger to set up a lab at their Marina del Rey condo. For the next month, Ellenberger's conversion operation ramped up production. Ellenberger's only real problem was obtaining enough quality product. On April 25, 1995, Ellenberger and Rossini were at Aria's apartment in Beverly Hills, waiting for a call from a potential supplier. Aria had stepped out and they were on the couch playing a video game when the phone rang. Rossini didn't answer it. Instead, he let the answering machine take the call. 
A female voice emanated from the speaker, and Rossini knew it wasn't their potential supplier. However, she sounded vaguely familiar. As the soft feminine voice thanked Aria for an amazing night and, of course, the flowers, Rossini made the connection. It was Jenny Braybrooks, Ellenberger's ex-fiancée. He immediately looked at Ellenberger, who was staring at the machine, dumbfounded. Suddenly, all of the mysteries associated with their breakup made sense. Aria was sleeping with Jenny. A calm came over Ellenberger, and he stumbled out of the apartment. They drove around West Los Angeles for a couple of hours, as Ellenberger talked about what a fool he'd been. I'm going to kill him, he declared at one point. However, the next morning he decided on a fate much worse. I'm going to put Aria in Mark Farchione and Sean's Barrero crosshairs. Ellenberger, along with Rossini, met Farchione in Marina del Rey the following week. Farchione broke the news that Gary Bernard was in federal custody. He's been arrested. An FBI DEA strike force out of Hawaii have him hemmed up, he reported. It's not good. Bernard had been indicted for participating in a massive cocaine and ice conspiracy, which included the 22 pounds of ice that the courier had turned in 18 months earlier. It was only a matter of time before the dominoes started to fall, all of which led to Ellenberger. Farchione continued, You're looking at some serious time. What's it going to cost me to get out of this? retorted Ellenberger. Farchione agreed to look into it. In less than 24 hours, Barrero called Ellenberger and Rossini. He'd spoken with an FBI agent on the Honolulu task force. He's blaming you, Ellenberger, for jump-starting an ice epidemic. They've got some of Robles' people in federal custody, and they're talking. Barrero disclosed that Frank Moon and William Batkin were cooperating. Bernard had yet to cooperate. However, he was facing a potential life sentence, so he'll break soon. Holy shit, gasped Ellenberger. The targets of the investigation, said Barrero, in descending order of importance are Tim Robles, John Ellenberger, John Boley, Ed Keeney, George Robles, Tim's brother, Anthony Mangamelli, and Lance Estes. As Barrero rattled off the names, Rossini could see desperation envelop Ellenberger. He was officially a principal target of one of the highest priority federal drug investigations on the West Coast and the largest ICE investigation ever. Farchione and Barrero stopped by the condo a few nights later. Ellenberger paid Farchione $20,000 for the information Barrero provided. He explained that there was no way to tank the Hawaii investigation. The investigation was simply too big. Barrero told Ellenberger that he should consider cooperating with the authorities in order to get out in front of the matter. What if I set up Robles? asked Ellenberger, knowing full well that Robles wouldn't do any business with him. And what if I threw in Estes and Aria? Package deal. Estes, like Robles, hated Ellenberger and would have nothing to do with him. I'm taking a big risk here. Robles is good for three or four murders. Tell the Hawaii feds I want immunity if I cooperate. Absolutely not, snapped Barrero. You're looking at 30 years, if not life. You started a fucking epidemic. You have no choice but to cooperate on their terms. In that vein, Ellenberger asked Nason, who was unaware of Ellenberger's plan, to contact Sid Berman, one of Estes' minions. Ellenberger offered to sell Berman a couple of pounds of ice. Days later, he purchased that product, and ten days after that, he bought an additional three pounds. Then, on the evening of May 18, 1995, Rossini met Michelle Vergara out at the Empire Ballroom nightclub. The couple was dancing when he noticed Nason step out of the crowd. He had just found out that Ellenberger was using him to set up Estes. Drunk and pissed off, Nason yelled over the music, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. I'm going to beat his ass. Don't do anything stupid, Rossini replied. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Rossini laughed off the threat, figuring it was the liquor talking. Shortly after Nason stumbled off, John Alonzo informed Rossini, Frankie, Nason, just left. He said he's going to the marina to deal with John, Ellenberger. Rossini had Alonzo drive him back to the condo. However, when they got there, Around 1 a.m., Ellenberger was watching cable and Nason was in the bathroom shaving, getting ready to go spend the night with a girlfriend. Everything seemed fine. Rossini got back to the club around 1.45 a.m. Sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 3.30 a.m., when Nason called Rossini's hotel room to speak with Alonzo, there was a confrontation of some nature. 
which ended with Nason strangling Ellenberger to death. Michelle drove me back to the marina the next afternoon, around 1 p.m., and waited in the car while I ran in to get a change of clothes, says Rossini. He and I are in the library, and Rossini seems melancholy at the thought of Ellenberger's homicide. They were friends, after all. He found the body lying face down on the floor of the bedroom. Ellenberger's head rested at an unnatural angle. Twisted and motionless. After determining Ellenberger was dead, Rossini regained his composure. He couldn't call the police and report there was a dead body in his drug lab. There were a few thousand doses of ecstasy, $20,000 in cash, and over a hundred pounds of ephedrine in a closet filled with laboratory equipment. Rossini grabbed Ellenberger's cell phone and paged Farchione, whom he believed was an FBI agent. He then grabbed his money, the ecstasy pills, and his laptop and ran out of the marina while placing calls to Farchione and Aria's pagers. Minutes later, he got in contact with Farchione. John's dead, and I don't know what to do. Stay cool, he replied. Don't call the cops. Rossini met with Nason, and he admitted to having killed Ellenberger. According to Nason, they had fought and he'd choked Ellenberger out. His hands were scratched and bruised. He sucker punched me and I snapped his neck. By that night, Alonzo and Rossini had enlisted Wayne Harrison's help. Harrison was a bookmaker, collections leg breaker thug, and occasional cocaine dealer whom Rossini knew through Alonzo and Bugrin. Rossini met with Harrison in Diamond Bar. For $40,000, Harrison and two of his men, Dean Zaroli and Kelly Davis, wrapped Ellenberger's body in industrial plastic and a sleeping bag. They disposed of it in south-central Los Angeles. The body was never recovered. Rossini began his drug trafficking relationship with Lance Estes on June 1, 1995. A couple of weeks later, on June 17, 1995, Reza, while acting as a courier for Arya, was arrested at LAX as he boarded a plane bound for Honolulu. He was transporting six pounds of ice. Rossini contacted Farchione and asked if there was anything he or Barrero could do to assist Reza. While waiting for their response, Rossini apprised Estes, who had supplied him two of the pounds that Reza had been arrested with, of the situation. I'm trying to get it taken care of, Rossini confided. He informed Estes that he knew a dirty FBI agent. Him and his partner are looking into it. The same agents that ripped off John, Ellenberger, and Tim, Robles. Less than two months later, Reza was walked out of the Los Angeles County Jail. Unbeknownst to Rossini, Estes and his best friend, Michael Cafalu, had been arrested in San Francisco a few months earlier for trafficking cocaine. Estes, the guy that had spent the previous 18 months calling Ellenberger a snitch, had entered into an agreement with the FBI to cooperate in exchange for time off his prospective sentence. Despite the agreement with the FBI, Estes was continuing to distribute cocaine and ice while pretending to cooperate. Do you think these agents can do something for me? Rossini made a second call, requesting Farchione and Barrero look into Estes' case. Farchione told Rossini that Barrero was close to the undercover agent in San Francisco, Randy Blum, another cross-designated BNE agent assigned to the FBI's drug task force, and that they could tank Estes' case for $100,000 and two pounds of ice. Estes was in shock. In less than an hour, Rossini had been able to obtain specific information about his case, including the identity of the undercover agent who had busted him. While he was contemplating the bribe offer, on January 19, 1995, one of Estes' distributors, Jeff Meacham, was arrested by the DEA at Maui International Airport. They seized five pounds of ice. What Estes didn't know was that his best friend, Kafalu, had betrayed him by reporting to the FBI that Estes was still trafficking drugs while pretending to work as an informant. On July 1, 1995, the day before Estes had planned to send Nason to Hawaii with seven pounds of ice, Rossini received a call from Farcion. Don't let Estes send the product, he warned. It's a bust. The Hawaiian feds are going to be waiting on Frankie at the airport. They're collapsing the Hawaii end of their conspiracy. Then, on the night that Rossini and Nason dropped off the initial 50000 payment from Estes, July 8th, Farchione explained that Estes was in a shitload of trouble. He's the target of Operation Avalanche, being run by the FBI's task force out of San Francisco. He entered into a cooperation agreement with their office, then double-crossed them. 
They're fully aware he's been playing them for fools, said Farshion. You let him know. We're the only thing keeping him from doing twenty years. I understand, mumbled Rossini. Tell him to stop all transactions and to keep his mouth shut. There's an informant in his organization. The confidential law enforcement information that Estes had entered into a cooperation agreement was then discussed with Harrison, Nason, and Francisco Diaz, one of Estes' associates. On July 19th, around 11 p.m., Rossini and Estes met Farchione in a parking lot. At the rendezvous, Estes wanted proof Farchione was FBI. In a swift motion, Farchione whipped out a badge connected to a lanyard around his neck and his automatic. He pointed the weapon at the flat of Estes' forehead and growled, I'll put a fucking bullet in your head right now. Estes froze. Farchione pulled a second automatic out of his back pocket. Then I'll put this piece on you. See my partner over there? He motioned to a serious-looking man across the street. He nodded at Estes. He's going to say you reach for the weapon. Now stop fucking around. Okay, all right, all right, gasped Estes. Farchione discussed the cooperation agreement Estes had entered into with the FBI's task force in San Francisco and identified the names of the agents who had interviewed Estes. Farchione also identified the names of Estes' associates in Los Angeles and Honolulu, whom the FBI and DEA were targeting including individuals in Honolulu, known to Estes, but unknown to Rossini. Farchione had Estes convinced that he was a federal agent. Estes wanted the name of the FBI informant in his organization. Farchione agreed once everything was over, he'd give him the name. One week later, on July 25th, Rossini delivered the second $50,000 to Farchione. However, within days, Barrero's superior, Randy Blum, was questioned by the U.S. Attorney's Office regarding allegations of corruption. It turned out that Estes had confided in Cephalou, who'd immediately notified his handler. That motherfucker's been running his goddamn mouth, yelled Farchione. You tell him the deal's off. Over the next week, Rossini managed to put the deal back together. However, Farchione and Barrero wanted an additional $50,000 for the headache Estes had caused. This, in turn prompted Farchione to instruct Rossini to shut down the lab. Farchione indicated that they were taking Estes down, and that papers were being filed in court later that week, charging Estes with drug trafficking. Rossini told Harrison that Farchione had told him to shut down the production until the matter with Estes could be resolved. On August 16, 1995, at a meeting between Harrison and Rossini, Harrison told Rossini that he had planned on killing Estes, Prior to finding out that Estes was an FBI informant, Harrison had conducted a couple of ice deals selling Estes' product. Harrison had also conducted a collection for Estes in Orange County, and had recently accepted another contract to do a collection in Alaska, an assignment both men understood complicated the likelihood of someone being harmed. This motherfucker could have been wearing a wire, growled Harrison. I'm just gonna kill him. What are you telling me for? snapped Rossini. It's none of my business. Harrison was under the false impression that Rossini knew Estes' address in San Francisco. I don't. Besides, the guy supposedly lives with his girlfriend. What if she's home? She's got to go, said Harrison. Nason recoiled. He was close to Estes. Rossini was indifferent about Estes. But he was strongly opposed to any innocent civilian being harmed. No, he objected. Look, let me call the agent. During that call, Rossini explained Harrison's plan and asked Farchione to talk to him, to straighten him out. The conversation sparked a meeting, wherein Farchione, Harrison, and Rossini met to discuss what Rossini thought was an alternative to killing Estes. Standing in a gas station's parking lot, Harrison laid out his plan for eliminating Estes. To Rossini's surprise, Farchione agreed that Estes had to be killed. His only concerns were where the murder should take place, Los Angeles, and to make sure no one finds the body. We're better off if he's considered a fugitive. Then, after another one of Estes' customers had been arrested the week before, this one in Alaska, Estes began to suspect that Suffolk may actually be the informant. That realization caused him to reevaluate his decision not to pay Farchione and Barrero. However, it took Rossini and Nason to convince him to take the deal. I swear to God, Farchione relented, if this motherfucker doesn't show up with the cash, I'm going to have Wayne, Harrison, Put a fucking bullet in him. We've got 86s across the board, gasped Rozak. 
frantically screwing the silencer on the muzzle of his Uzi subcompact assault rifle as he rushed out of the kitchen. It was August 28, 1995. Rossini and George Mrozak, one of Harrison's associates, were waiting at Harrison's beach house in Newport Beach. Harrison and Nason had picked up Estes from the airport, and they were due to arrive any minute. In addition, Rossini had asked Craig Aranaga, an associate, to accompany him due to the volatile atmosphere surrounding the Estes issue. Unfortunately, 86 was the pager code indicating that Estes had arrived without the cash, and Marison and Rozek intended to kill him. Rozek torqued down on the silencer and repeated, We got 86s. Fuck, snapped Rossini. He was only at the house because he'd been led to believe the hit had been called off. He and Aranaga hadn't signed up for a murder. To top it off, the vehicle pulled up to the curb outside the house with Estes before Rossini and Aranaga could even consider leaving. Instead, Rossini's stomach wrenched. He got up off the couch, turned to Aranaga, and said, I can't watch this. As Harrison, Nason, and Estes entered the front door, Rossini stepped into the garage. Mrozek was on the back deck, pretending to work on Harrison's Harley. In truth, he was revving the engine to drown out the sound of the gunshot. Estes followed Nason into the kitchen, and Harrison walked in behind them. Nason opened the refrigerator to grab a beer. He leaned over. Harrison whipped out a twenty-five caliber semi-auto and, at point-blank range, fired a single slug into the back of Estes' skull. His body collapsed to the floor. When Rossini re-entered the house, Harrison was digging through Estes' pockets. Rossini stood inside the doorway, staring at the lifeless body sprawled out on the tile. In a numb monotone, Rossini asked, What happened? He said he had the money. Harrison thrust his hand in the air with a rectangular piece of paper clenched in his fist. He brought a fucking check. Estes had twenty grand in cash and a thirty thousand dollar cashier's check. A fucking check! Harrison pocketed the cash and handed Aranaga the firearm to dispose of. Within minutes, Harrison, Aranaga, and Mrozek wrapped the body in industrial plastic and a sleeping bag. The following night, the body was disposed of in a dumpster in Oceanside, San Diego County. Less than 24 hours later, a homeless man digging for cans found the remains. A few days later, on September 1, 1995, the FBI raided Rossini's parents' house in connection with federal charges out of Hawaii. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Honolulu had misidentified Pierre Rossini, due to his occasional use of his younger brother's express card, as John Rossini. The next day, Rossini called his mother to say hello. What have you done now? she shrieked. The FBI arrested your brother. They had taken him to the Metropolitan Detention Center in Los Angeles. Let me make a call. Rossini contacted Farchione and explained the situation. Barrero made a few calls, and by that afternoon, he had not only arranged to get Johnny released, he had the FBI drive him home and the lead agent apologize to Rossini's parents. That night, Farchione called Rossini. God damn it, he yelled. I thought Wayne said they wouldn't find the fucking body. The Oceanside Police Department not only had found Estes' body, the homicide detectives had identified him. Within days, both agents Barraro and Blum had spoken with the detectives, who were insisting the three of them, Farchione, Barraro, and Blum, answer some questions. Farchione met with Harrison, Rossini, and Nason, and they coordinated their stories. Harrison met with Detective Peretta and gave him the agreed-upon narrative. Nason used the pretext of having warrants to refuse to meet with the detectives. As for Rossini, he was told by Barrero not to speak with the detectives, that all law enforcement inquiries had to go through him because he, Barrero, was Rossini's handler. One week later, Rossini was a little drunk when an L.A. sheriff's deputy asked for his ID after he left a Beverly Hills nightclub. Assuming the feds had cleared his brother's name, Rossini handed them his brother's ID, John Rossini. He was arrested for public intoxication. Once Rossini was in the holding cell, around 3 a.m., he called Robbie Messias, one of Rossini's friends from high school. Robbie knew about Rossini's relationship with a crooked federal agent. Robbie turned around and called Farchione. Farchione called Barrero, who immediately called the West Hollywood Sheriff's substation, and by 6.30 a.m., Despite having two federal warrants for his arrest, Rossini was released. Untouchable, Rossini tells me. That's how I felt. 
He was convinced that Farcione and Barrero would get him dropped from the Hawaii and San Francisco indictments, as well as cleared of the Estes murder. It seemed like they could take care of anything with just a couple of calls. Then, on January 5, 1996, Rossini was arrested for possession of a false ID while in Newark, New Jersey. Once again, he was booked as John Rossini. However, this time he wasn't able to get out of the building before he was correctly identified as Pierre Rossini. This concludes Part 1 of Devil Exposed. To learn how the government covered up the FBI's involvement in the murders, please listen to Part 2 of Devil Exposed.